Here. Mr. Pitten? Here. And Mr. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So, Nikki, let's do some quick ground, ground rules and uh, okay. see what we have. All right. So, in front of you is a blue packet. In this blue packet Your is the schedule. Got it. Okay. Yep. You have an hour with each candidate. And then on the other side, you have the candidate's resume and cover letter if they submitted one. And attached to that resume is a copy of the questions for each candidate. Okay, so you should have three packets, three sets of questions. Okay. So um, you, with an hour with um, each candidate, you have a little bit of time in between as a break. And then at around seven o'clock or so, Heather O'Brien and some other folks from this morning's interview will come and share their thoughts about how the interviews went this morning. And then from there, you can adjourn or uh, figure out what the next step is. Okay. Any thoughts or questions? Well, I wondered if we had any predisposed ideas of how we're going to handle the, af the after the interviews. And is our thought that we will do our Converse with each candidate. We'll have the debrief. We can chat. Um, Heather Atal will come and talk with us. And then, was your were your collective thoughts that we then reflect and come back on Tuesday? Do we? I guess I'm just curious about what you all have. I, th I think it can go several directions. I think one direction would be is if if after the reflection and the conversation, if we <coughs> feel at that point there's a clear consensus that we're at a point we want to make a decision, mm -hmm. then we look maybe and say we we come back Tuesday. If we feel that we can make a recommendation after that reflection time, I think we could make a recommendation tonight. But I think let's just let the events take place and go through it and then see where we are, at what comfort level we're at at the end of this and see where we are as far as the decision. I think when we talked the other day that what Tom said that prior was we would um, be able to to digest everything over the weekend and then make a decision on Tuesday. But like you said, if but if tonight, we, tonight we, we may. And we, we also have the ability to just to be honest. We have the ability to talk to each other over the weekend. We sure. can assemble as a group. But sure. Doug, if I want to hear what you have to say, I've got um, certainly uh, able to call you if we if I want to hear more about your thoughts after listening to this for four or five hours. So. Um, so, 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 so I guess I, I, I'm prepared to do it tonight, but I'm also real prepared to right. be able to talk to one another before a, a Tuesday meeting. Um, yes. My question, go ahead, if we're on the same subject, go oh, Well, it was going to be more of a question about confidentiality and um, references and recommendations. So just because I'm new to this and I want to know what's, it, it's, it's unusual to have such public sort of interview and obviously people in confidence have given us letters of recommendation and I would imagine I mean I'm curious how we handle our thoughts about about not the letters so much as your reference checks mm -hmm. and information which I thought was very valuable that came from those but I, I would imagine that's somewhat confidential when we have people in giving us this information so how do we handle those responses to those things publicly those references are confidential and shouldn't be shared, right? In, in, <laughs> it's good to ask. Yeah. <laughs> and, and shouldn't be shared in an open meeting. But one of the last questions that, that you'll be asking tonight um, might hit to what some of those areas might be. And then you can ask some follow-up questions based on the candidate's response. And if I have specific reservations about the responses to your questions, those need to be shared privately with an individual Yes, I would share them with Tom. Okay. Yeah. Or we could talk. You can share them with me. All right. So I, I just want to make sure because my it was my understanding when we met last week that we have the opportunity to have follow up questions that we're not um, at all um, bound by just the very few printed questions on this page. If in that response to question one, I've got follow-up questions. I am absolutely free to ask those follow-up questions. You are absolutely free okay. to do that. We do want to make sure that we stay within our time constraints if we can. Um, and 
We also want to stay away from those topics of questions that we are not allowed to ask in an interview. Like, you have any kids and you're like married. Really and exactly. What religion are you? Like exactly. Religion are you <laughs> right. You got it. Yeah. Are you going to like wave your hand or kick us under the table if we sort of go near it? You'll sure. have How old are you? You'll see some sort of <laughs> physical reaction from me. Okay. Yes. Well, that would be good, though, actually, if, if we do you know, jump in and say no. Yep. Say yeah. yeah. And, and you guys, um, uh, in the heat of the moment, if somebody does ask a question that you feel, oh, this might be treading the line a little bit, it's okay for any of you to interrupt and say, no, let's stick back or let's go back to... Uh, something else. So. I'm actually not very much worried about this group about that. I Good. Every conference. Excellent. But you're you're right. The intent was that when when uh, the candidates respond to, to uh, topic items, that we can delve into those. So, so it, it was my it was my thought after last week that the candidates would get our questions in advance, would present on them, and then we'd follow up questions. And I'm okay that it's going on it this way. I just uh, did not want to forego the ability for each one of us, or particularly me, um, to, to follow with stuff I'm not sure. Well, and I think it's going to be incumbent upon all of us and the candidates as well that we only have so much time to spend on this, so we're going to really have to pace ourselves. And while it's important to ask follow-up questions and look for in-depth responses, that we don't find ourselves wallowing around one question for 40 minutes. So we're going to have to find a way to maybe pace ourselves and sure, yeah. make that work. I can do okay. that. And the uh, candidates were given the questions this morning after their interview. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Okay. so they have had an opportunity to at least look at them and they know um, hopefully that uh, you know they can come prepared with um, some succinct answers, but also be willing to go more in depth based on your follow-up questions. Great. I love being back here at BTK. There's, there, I mean, seriously, there's an intimacy. I don't know who Tom and I have been in this boardroom as board members. I'm not sure. Were you ever here? In the Dutch have been to. But it's just a lot nicer room to talk to people in than, than uh, I, lo I love Butler, but it's sometimes not very intimate. Yes. All right. So, thank you to you and your else? staff getting yes. everything organized, yes. and uh, because it was a short short time frame, to, and, and getting all the Amy's suggestion, they're getting all the reference checks done early. That saves us quite a bit of time. So, well, it was our pleasure, and Crystal, Crystal was a huge help. Yeah. So. Thanks, Crystal. And I, I, I did like some of the reference stuff. That came in. I thought it was just like Amy. I thought it was informative. Yes. Good. All right. Okay. So we have a few minutes. And, uh, so we thought Tom. Uh, well, Norm Tom is here. Norm's so whenever here. you're ready, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're good. So, so, but whenever you're ready, yeah, um, we obviously <clears throat> need the candidate to introduce himself yeah. so the crowd can hear us. Yeah. I, I, what I'll try to do is just uh, get us started, <coughs> keep us paced. You guys ask the follow-up questions you need to ask. Um, she's going to give me a signal when we have about ten minutes left, so we know where we are to kind of wrap things up. Anything else you think I need? Mean? Is this being, um, um, is this, we don't have an internet connection live on this meeting, correct? I don't know. There's sure a lot of technology and cameras. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. are, 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 are things live on, on, on this yeah. feed? No? No. So, no. so, but we are recording this for, and we'll, we'll post it? Or well, you know, well, yeah, and I, I, I really appreciate the audience being here because I hear today there's quite some hearings on TV that are quite interesting. Oh, it's been a good and that you've decided to come and be a part of this. <laughs> Let's okay. not get that interesting. You know, I'd be really great if we don't get that interesting next year. <laughs> I do too. Okay, so are you guys ready to yeah. start, do you think? So? Norm, can we call you Norm or would oh, you be more comfortable please. with Dr. Ritter? Oh, no, I'm comfortable with whatever you want to call me as long as it's about black. Okay. Well, come Norm's on good. Up. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Good. Always uh, good. Thank you for coming. How are you back? Thank you for spending time with us. Um, I think you kind of got the gist of what we're going to do. You've had the opportunity to look at the questions and we're going to allow you to kind of follow through that uh, outline as you uh, share your thinking with us. And as we share, uh, members of the board will interject and ask, you know, follow-up questions or more clarifying questions if you're comfortable with that. Uh, 
I don't think any of them will be really interrupting you. We want to make sure we have that opportunity. So um, we can introduce, we'll go around real quick and introduce ourselves. Um, I know they're name tags, but that's not as personal maybe as an introduction. No, I'm John Williams. You and I met on, on the way in. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. And you're an attorney. Yes. Sir. But don't hold that against him. Oh, I have a son, and my youngest son's an attorney. I understand those guys. <laughs> I'm Paul Pitton, um, 39 years in education. What do you do? Um, other than being on the Board of Education, I've taught mathematics, high school oh, mathematics, okay. and uh, strength and conditioning, and okay. I ran a television studio. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And coached a lot of sports. Oh. Uh, Tom Parrish. How are you? I'm good. And what do you do? Um, I'm retired, kind of. Um, I was in education. I've been in public education. I've worked at the university level, different things. So. And now I'm retired, still working. I'm Doug Levinson. Um, I retired uh, four years ago as a school administrator here in our district. Wow, a lot of educators here. Yeah, mm -hmm. for 34 years. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi. I'm Hi. Amy Davis. Hi, nice Amy. To meet you. Glad to meet you. I, uh, there. Now I can see you there. Now you can see my name. And what do you do? I'm a physician here in town. Oh, okay. I've lived here for 20, I guess, coming on 22 years now. Okay. Yep. I'm a family physician. I also run the local HIV project for Western Colorado. Um, I teach residents at the local residency program, and I'm on the faculty there. Um, good. It's a good job. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you some information about me that you don't need to ask about and feel like you're illegal. Okay. Right. I am married. I have five children who uh, have given us eight grandchildren. Uh, four of the uh, children live on the Front Range uh, as far north as uh, Fort Collins and as far south as just on this side of, uh, of uh, Conifer. And, um, and they uh, are precious to us. And I have a son who's a principal at uh, Lucia Urban uh, Middle School in Loveland. So he's involved in education, etc. And then my wife uh, is a retired nurse, uh, kidney dialysis nurse. So that background. I, I come from a very rich uh, background in uh, Franciscans, Dominicans, uh, Benedictines, Vincentians type of ba background. Um, I went to a high school and a boarding school. So very rigorous, uh, uh, critical thinking type of environment is where I came from. I uh, went to St. Thomas in Denver. Uh, for, for, for my college, uh, that was an interesting experience. But anyway, uh, that's my background. As far as education is concerned, uh, I uh, was a teacher for about five years. And then after that, I went right into administration and uh, uh, served as a uh, principal um, in both Catholic public schools. Probably my richest experience as a principal was at Father Flanagan's Boys Home in a risk environment where we took care of the toughest kids in America. It was a flagship. We had about 18 different places across the country, and, uh, and so anyway, that was a great experience, understanding the classroom. Uh, from around that type of experience, I also ran uh, the Catholic Archdiocese of Denver, uh, ran uh, and was a principal in Academy District. Uh, probably where I really, really grew was that experience, was uh, running Liberty High School. I was there a year, and then uh, the, the superintendent had some problems uh, with finance, and projecting and making some fault, uh, wrong assumptions. It was, he just basically didn't do due diligence on it, and uh, so they had to release him, and they asked me to take over, so I did. And then I went from there to, uh, as a, I was an interim, then I went from there as an interim to uh, uh, District uh, 11, and from there I retired and went to Spring, Springfield, Missouri, and I was in Missouri for about 12 years, and Springfield I was there for nine years and then after that I was an in interim because they I kept trying to get back to Colorado to my grandchildren and I'd get a call so I'd go to went to St. Louis in South County St. Louis then I got a call and I went to Joplin and uh, Joplin experience was really an interesting experience Joplin went through that tornado um, and after the tornado a lot of dysfunction they had to build new schools they had to do a lot of different things and, and they were also on the national scene and the superintendent basically was disconnecting with the district and got into a major problem and so really the whole the whole system was becoming very dysfunctional and I had to go in there and spend two years to uh, to work with that system so I basically uh, have been uh, called to uh, really be an interim or to really go into a system and, and and 
change it and make it give it some focus. Along that line, I am also uh, an examiner of high performance systems. I basically uh, am a Baldrige certified uh, examiner. Uh, last fall, I examined a major district in Colorado. I was part of that team looking at that. I've examined hospitals, I've examined churches, and uh, part of that. Uh, training, I also uh, have brought it to the forefront and uh, have uh, really brought high performance uh, to the classroom, uh, to the, the overall system, and really taken a very systematic, systemic approach uh, to a system to, to really drill down and find what the community wants and then deliver on that, what the community wants. So that's, that's who I am and why am I in District 51? I have to be honest with you, I'm board stiff. I, I've, been, I've been retired for a year. And uh, yes, I, I, I've been, I'm working with a church, putting their strategic plan together. I'm, I, I've helped two districts hire superintendents. I've uh, uh, did some examiner work, uh, but still, to be in the trenches with the kids and the teachers, uh, I really missed it. And as I was looking at this, I was looking at it on behalf of uh, a, a firm uh, to be able to help you with uh, the search for a new superintendent. And as I was digging in and drilling into it, I found that uh, uh, you guys are very similar to Springfield, Missouri. Unbelievable how similar you are. And really the combination of Springfield, Missouri and Joplin. And if you go online, you'll find out whether, whether, whether they're very similar. Uh, you know, they have universities, you have 10,000. Uh, Springfield uh, has really around 50,000 college kids with about uh, 13 different institutions. So it's a college type of town, but it's also very it's kind of the buckle of the Bible belt, all right? I'm not saying that you are, but you kind of have a feel about that. And then also in Joplin, uh, uh, very similar in size, as far as size meaning uh, Grand Junction community, but the dis district itself is about 7,000, whereas Springfield is about 25,000. So that's another reason why I'm here. I think I can uh, help you guys build trust. That's what I do. Okay. Second question. Yeah, you just, just move through these Oh, okay. That's your... um, if I were hired as, as the interim superintendent, what would you bring to our district that would make the biggest difference? Uh, sharp focus on children with a very uh, impassioned uh, support and empowerment of teachers, where the teachers basically um, will have full empowerment, but with empowerment becomes accountability. And, and so there would be that understanding and really finding out what the voice of the child is, the family, and, and the teacher. And so uh, when it's all said and done, you'll have a really sharp uh, focus as far as strategic focus, along no with knowing where your community is at, not just the internal community, but also the external community. You'll have a good feel for that. And I'll share some of the results that I've come up with in my last experiences, and you'll get a, kind of a sense uh, what that's going to look like, okay? And so uh, that would be what I would see as making the biggest difference. Building trust and the community falling in love with its children is, is a big thing that I think I would do. So How I, would you build the trust? Well, basically it's all about building a face of the district. I would become the face of the district. And then I would build a opportunity for, uh, and I would start internal and work out. And so what I like to do is I like to have uh, what I call forums uh, that meet monthly, and I would have teacher forums, student forums, um, uh, parent forums. Senior citizens are critical. Senior citizens love, grandparents love their grandchildren more than the parents love their children, uh, because I can attest to that. And so I really, uh, I have a senior forum as well, and we meet monthly uh, through December. But now here it's later, so it's gonna be difficult, but we still can do it. And then that's where you bring a lot of trust. But as, as I put together the language, as I'm beginning to, and I research it, there's what I call the human centered design, it's a, and it's a approach, you can go online to get the real uh, language around that. But I would use human centered design to go into the classrooms and randomly pick uh, at all levels, and then also go into the community, and then eventually put together what I would sense is the voice, and then eventually test that voice by going to every site and meeting with the staff at every site to make sure that that is the voice that uh, they sense because the teachers need to own this, okay? And so that's how I would do it, is build that trust from there. And then uh, I would be in the community, I would be at a lot of functions. Uh, I, I have no problems uh, uh, sharing what I see 
Uh, I am not in any way going to project what needs to happen. I am going to tell people what I'm finding out. So you build trust by establishing that baseline of understanding, and then you build on that to be able to uh, sharpen the focus of the child in the classroom. That's how you build trust. A little more specifically, um, like your first 30 days, you're coming into a new town, you're coming into a new district, um, it, it, it could be overwhelming, and, and yet, yet it's a short interim job. So you got to do something really effective. No question. To me, I've done walking this. out the first thirty, and I, I think the normal question is, give me the first hundred days. But I'm I'm really curious, like first week, first month. No question. And it, it, you know, I've done this quite a few times, and every time your resume has a lot of interim on. Yeah, yeah and yeah. for now or that, every time I go as a superintendent, yeah. uh, you don't you don't take a step unless you know where you're at. And so I'll, I'll be hitting every classroom, okay? I'll be, I will be sitting down, first of all, with every administrator, one-on-one, -on -one, okay? And, and I really have that conversation. Then I'll be in every classroom. And then I'm gonna randomly pick teachers as I'm going through the classroom. I am going to be going to the high schools and middle schools and have conversation with kids, not the high-performing as much, but the kids that I'm seeing that are not engaged. I'm gonna have those kinds of conversations as well, okay, to make sure that I can start building a voice, start building some language, be able to understand that. And then from there, and that's, to me, that's your first 30 days. I'm talking 30 days, one month, okay? Now, if I had, if I had started in July, I would say by October 1st, I guarantee you that I will have, I would have a strong uh, picture of what the district needs as far as what they have already, strengths, opportunities and then also what the major challenge is in leadership strategic planning and also the voice and then when you, when you get a feel for those three the trust is automatic it's just automatic you don't it's not an emotional thing trust is not an emotional thing trust is knowing what you need to know the data and so for instance what is your teacher retention i'm understanding it's pretty good does the community know that Okay, and why is the teacher retention so good? That's because the community treasures its teachers. We need to say that, okay? Then, then also, your kids. How resourceful and what kind, how strong are the kids? And then you need to have language around what that is, too. PR is not your PR department. PR is the voice of the teacher and the voice of the children and parents. That's what you need to find out where it's at, and then you need to build on that, and that's where you build that trust because it's coming from that classroom and it's going into the community that way. Because anything you do outside of that is going to be short term. And that, that does not build trust. Because when you build that emotional high, you come down just as fast. And so that's, that's how you do it. That's how I've done it. And so, okay. okay. Um, while well, we really are getting into the other stuff that we just, that you have listed here, please spend a few minutes and talk about your strengths and weaknesses in these. Uh, in each of these areas, communicating with staff and community. I've already talked about that as far as the staff is concerned, the forums, um, getting to each classroom, meeting uh, staff at the sites, uh, getting to know them that way. And uh, uh, and then, by the way, it, you know, I communicate with staff and community, but the board also needs to be part of that conversation. The board has to be informed as we're going along. We can't have you guys out there wondering what this guy's doing, okay? And so there's gonna be a weekly summary of things that I'm finding that's going to go to you. Okay. Is that is that paper or is that uh, email. direct contact? Well, it can be direct contact too because what a lot of what I like to do there is send you the email, and that's public information by the way. Send you the email, and then you can call me, and I can call you if there's if I need if I need. I'm not used to five people by the way. I'm used to seven or nine. So anyway, so it's going to be a lot easier to have personal conversations than it is uh, than in the past or other places like that. But. I have no problem with uh, phone conversations either, but uh, that's always going to give you a summary, and it's going to be very, very concise and succinct. And, uh, and so, and it's always going to have a nice, uh, positive aura about it. But if there's areas of concern, you know, and the areas of concerns are always going to be stated in uh, opportunities to get better, as opposed to areas of concern where these are problems. Okay, you're always going to have opportunities to get better. And so, anyway, that's that's how that works. Um, so now, as far as the community is concerned, you're going you're to find that I'm going to want to get on, uh, take look, look and find out where um, where the nurse centers are. And so when I'm when I would first come in, I'm going to be sitting down with each of you and find out from your perspective where the, where the nurse center is. In other words, as far as the community is concerned, and then from I'm going to ask each of you for five people. 
okay, five people that you think can communicate with me, um, uh, you know, where the community is at. And then I will visit with those five people one on one. I'll go to their homes, I'll go to their business, whatever it is. And so that's only 25 people, so that won't take very long to do that. And, and I do that every time. Uh, I know the time's a little bit more concise, but that's what I want to do. Okay. We Can start. I ask you a quick Wait, question? Yes, please. Appreciate you. You made a statement that uh, caught my attention on uh, your PR is truly coming from the children and their families. How do you build that culture in the school that that kind of message that we're looking for is getting out into the community to uh, generate that positive feeling towards the school district? It really, it really needs to be talking points by the site itself and, and some work around that as far as talking points. And it really needs to be language around children, okay? That's where, that's where you, you shape that language. And it needs to be as, cons as consistent as you can across the system, but making sure that it's authentic, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's how you create that voice. And so, for instance, I think um, it, the question was asked this morning, what, what, what would I like to hear come out of the mouth of a child? a system that I'm in charge of. Well, to me, it's not whether they got an A or not. It's whether they are engaged and excited about how this added to their critical thinking. Okay, they wouldn't use critical thinking in kindergarten. But still, you can find that language in kindergarten, believe it or not. And so I really think that's, that's how you do that. Okay, anyway, any other questions? Um, the... Um, one thing I want to mention about is, as far as restoring trust in the community and staff, uh, the Teachers Association, I know there's not a support staff association, but I need to meet with them weekly uh, because they do get uh, the complaints. Uh, they do get the concerns. And I need to hear from them, and, it need, and we need to have a frank conversation, and they can bring as many people with them as they want. Uh, um, because that part, you know, they're always going to say, you know, when I meet with people, they're, the power of the superintendency is not, shouldn't be there, but that tends to be natural. Whereas when you have them at the table, they tend to uh, share. Another thing I want to mention as far as building trust, I forgot to mention is, is that uh, within a high performance system, any kind of complaints that come to the table have to be responded to within 24 hours. And if you don't respond within 24 hours, your, your trust starts breaking down really fast. And even if it's the most ridiculous thing you can think of, okay, if, uh, we think it's your, your uh, security dogs that are doing something on my lawn. We don't have security dogs, ma'am. But you know, you gotta you gotta respond to them. And so I think I think that's another thing that we need to figure out and consider. So go, going back to the teachers association, um, um, uh, would would you be comfortable with um, probably more interaction with the teachers association than what you've described today? For example. Um, the head of the union sits in our leadership uh, trainings on a monthly basis, leadership academy. She um, sits on the couch, sits the superintendent's couch. Well, I, I, uh, I, no, no, I've had all that. In, in fact, I meet with her, her name. Heather. Yeah, she, she said, I'm going to wear you out. And I said, no, I'm going to wear you out. But the, the bottom line here is that I do meet with her every week. And then we talk about how you know, how we're going to hear, how we're finding out information. And so, yeah, she's going to sit on everything, and I, I think that's great. And now I think the support staff needs to be there somehow as well. The support staff, you wouldn't believe how the custodian, the secretary, the bus drivers are in that community as much, if not more, than the teachers are. And so I think that's a critical piece, a part of the puzzle that we need to, need to figure out as well. Okay. Okay, helping uh, the, uh, the D51 learning model move forward. I have a pretty good feel what that is, and I'm always concerned about it being a program as opposed to being a system. And, and so uh, I've been able, to, from this morning, I picked up some, my, some sense of where it's at, and, uh, and uh, I will need, in my conversations uh, with uh, the teachers, to find out what kind of buy-in there is in the model itself. And so once I know what the buy-in is, because really, just like anything else, every single program is very, very effective provided you have complete buy-in. And a lot of times the breakdown in the buy-in is that they don't know what it is. They don't know what they don't know. And so ultimately that's what, you, what I think 
may, if I find out anything about the model, is that there's going to be some ignorance around it, and therefore they're going to be concerned about the model, and and therefore the model's controlling them as opposed to that being a tool to be able to support them. And so the learning model, I would say, we, I'm going to have to, we're going to have to find out where it's at, how it's rolled out, what kind of buy-in is there, and then eventually make sure that it's going to be uh, understood in its purest form. That's how that works. And so. Um, my sense is that it's pretty well rolled out. In fact, your, your strategic plan is tied into the model itself. And uh, so... Uh, uh, Tell me what you understand about the model. It's about, all about personal learning. It's all about... <coughs> it's Hattie's. It's based in Hattie. And a, a lot of the work that he's done... He's from Australia. It, a lot of the work that he's done. And it basically, it's, it's a model of individualized uh, learning, differentiated type of learning. That's part of the language. And that's really what the learning model is all about, is to engage every child at their level of learning and then eventually put together a strategy uh, to help that child move through that process. That's a pretty simple way of, simplest way I can come up with the learning model. And, and what has been your experience with models such as that in other schools? And a follow-up question would be, have you been involved with a <coughs> relatively large change in uh, a school strategy around learning and how did that go for you? Oh yeah, that uh, chopper. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's not that large. About seven thousand came in and did study the environment and uh, looked at the. Uh, and I'm going to share some of this with you. Um, did all the research that I did, and then we found out that the adult and student behavior was really needed a lot of work. And so we uh, put together a strategy to deal with. See, they had a, a control type of behavior approach. And really, we needed to shift that to a teaching behavior approach, starting with the adults on how to have eye contact, on how to be able to introduce help, but also to have a conversation and to listen. And so we had to do that, put that in place. That surprised everybody, but they all agreed that was a problem. And a lot of that behavior issue in Joplin came because of all the chaos around the tornado and how people were basically um, randomly in, in, in and almost a reckless abandonment doing a lot of things and stepping over people. And it, it was still there when I got there. So we had to focus in on the behavior and make a major change in behavior. Uh, in Springfield, we made a major shift uh, and we uh, eventually put together a strategic focus. And the focus was around uh, a, uh, making learning personal. And uh, that was our uh, the strategic title of our strategic plan. And the making the learning personal was really more targeting the adult in the system so that we could help the adult uh, find out where they're at. And then eventually the system is what the way we approached. We did not evaluate, per se, as evaluate. We basically reviewed their system and how we, their system can, can improve. So the systemic approach, we had systematic and systemic with the integration and alignment of the system. Uh, with that focus in place, in place of evaluation, evaluation can help you with that. But really this, the systemic review basically was at every day, every day they need to be looking for ways to get better. Then within that systemic review, uh, you're going to be identifying waste that needs to be done away with. And so when you have a high performance system, the waste is easy to do away with. When you don't have a high performance system, the waste is the hardest thing to get rid of. And so that's, I've done that in most every district is shifted away from evaluation to systems reviews. I'm curious about your comment about um, you made a major change in behavior. And, and, and was that behavior kids? Adults and kids. In the community as well. Can you describe how, what changes you made and how it was done? I, I, I'm curious. Well, I'm going to give this to you now then because you're, going to, you're taking me to, into the details here. This is the outcome. Anybody in the uh, in the audience can have. Let's see how many are here. Three, five. I need one more for myself. Anybody in the audience wants one? Here, this is yours. Take one. Move it. I guess I guess I'm focusing on behavior in the sure. classroom, right. and, and, that's right. and I'm not I'm not sure that's. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at trauma-informed... Um, oh, no, I don't expect you... No, no. This is what I came up with in this system. In this, in this, in, in uh, 
D51, that no, I'm not assuming that we're going to have a behavior issue at all. I'm just saying this is what happened in the Joplin system. So you're talking about process versus, yeah. versus the product. That's right. This is all about process. And so I came up, this is what we came up with as a strategic focus for Joplin based on the research that we were able to do. And this, uh, this plan was put in place within seven months of my being there. Okay. And so that's what this, that's what the process is. And so you can see in the vision piece, for instance, every word in there is measurable. And we did actually uh, put together a strategy to be able to meet those. I guess one of the questions I have is, um, there's no question that you, you, you've been able and successful in putting processes in place. But I guess the question I would have is, what kind of inventory have you done of our system to see what processes we have in place? I, 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 and then how you, how you would move those forward rather than to begin, a, begin to move us into the uh, development of new processes. So how would you go about that, knowing where we are? So I'd like to hear more about that. How will you gain an inventory of where we are, what processes we have, and then that. So that's, share a that's, little bit about that. That's the one-to-one -one conversations. That's the human-centered design approach. I will go out gather all that data and then and keep you guys informed as we go along. You'll see in that packet that there's uh, a listing of strengths, opportunities, and major challenges. That all came after 90 days. Well, in my case, in this case here, in the size of the district that you have, I'll probably have to do, you know, short circuit that a little bit to be able to come up with it. But I, I need to really, I can go online. I can go in and maybe have a couple conversations. I could talk to central office. I could talk, talk to a couple principals. That doesn't tell me anything. I really need to get in the trenches before I can answer that question. And so I, my sense is that you do have some processes in place that are working really well. I need to find that out. And it's not basically me telling them, it's me listening and asking the questions. And then they, and a lot of that is through collaboration, through my forums and different things like that. So ultimately after really about three months, it, you will have a good feel of where things are at and where things need to go. And that's what, where this came from. So basically what you're saying in your interim uh, situation or relationship with us, you're going to be more of a, in an audit function to where you feel rather than being a change agent, you're going to be able to uh, basically bulge examine our system in a sense and be able to give us back and say, here are your areas of strength, here are your opportunities for improvement uh, based on the processes and the things that we have in place. Only if that's what you want. Here, let, on the last page here, go to the last page. If that's what you as a board want. Because we'll start with you as a conversation. I can tell you what I can do. Okay, but it's going to be up to you uh, to determine. And so this is what the board and I worked up. And I was able to accomplish these three goals by the end of the year. But I started in July there. Okay? And I came up with these goals after I did the research. Uh, it started July 20th. I was able to come up with this by uh, uh, October 1st. The same thing happened in Melville, by the way. Melville was pretty simple, and I think you're a lot like Melville. Melville has a lot of things in place, great classrooms, good teachers, good site leadership, central office, a lot of strength in central office. That wasn't true of Joplin. Joplin was a mess. They'll tell you that. And so what I, would do, what I did in Melville, I found out right away what the issue was. Sat down with the board. A couple board members didn't like what I was telling them, but they were going broke. They only had, they were budgeting at $5 million deficit, and the public didn't even know that. So we put everything in place, we became very transparent, we aligned everything, and then uh, and, and made, it, made it, and of course the empowerment of teachers was already kind of there, so we didn't have to do a whole lot of that. I don't think we're gonna to need to do that much here. See, that would be my question in, in the fact that in a transitional period which we're in, how do, you, how do you navigate with us as a board to really help us identify what are our strengths, our opportunities for improvement? as we move ahead and look for the next superintendent. I think that would be a valuable look for. I can do that for you. No question. Now, I can also tell you your strengths, opportunities, and major challenges as a board as well. Right. I will have that conversation with you as a team. Right. This is your strengths. This is your opportunities. And and your major challenge as a board is this. And so, uh, I don't know you guys at all. I mean, for several minutes. So. You know, you, you talked a lot about the strengths that you have and the abilities and the skill sets that you have to move forward. Um, what we do know in education is that in order to really move forward, we have to be collaborative and work as a team. 
what, what are your steps or what are your experiences and how you would go about developing good teams in order to do that important work? You're talking about board teams or you're talking about, oh teams no, everything, the district. How would you do everything's that? collaborative. And that's what you're getting a sense of as far as the forums I have. I, I, I would have a leadership, I even called into the district to find out what the leadership, who in the leadership was reporting to the, the superintendent to kind of get a sense of baseline. I really couldn't get my hands around it that way. So anyway, I, uh, and so I would basically uh, look for ways to identify systems and then collaboration within those systems. So you have a central office, you have a, you have a, a service area, you have transport, you have all those different things. Well, how do you best organize those people to have collaboration, have conversation, to be able to help them become high-performing systems? And it might be a case of where you're doing it individually. I find it much better to have everybody come at the table and we're going to find some common strengths that we can live off, thrive through, but also we'll have some common opportunities. And I think the major challenge that we're going to find is, okay, what does this mean, a lack of trust? You've got a very resourceful community. Who approached, who have supported a bond in a million. By the way, congratulations, you guys, on that. And so you, you have that energy there. So you know you've got it going. Okay, so now you need to label it. You need to nail it. And then from there, you built. And so that's all. And the only way you were able to pass that, that bond, I talked to your director of founda uh, foundation, and she was led it, I understand it. And the only way you did that was to build your teams. You can't do this in isolation. And so that's. That's what you do is you're looking for ways to collaborate within the team. But you can't build teams that are not collaborative or don't have the same focus. You can't have the support services meeting with teachers. Yeah, I tried that one. That doesn't work very well. But anyway, so that's how you collaborate. And collaboration drives your high performance, by the way. Um, that's what the number of the first category in high performance is a humble leadership that is very collaborative. That's Number one, number, and so you're going to have to have a super talent like that, by the way. And I helped uh, the last two systems that I worked, no, three systems that I worked. In each case, they're humble superintendents who are driving their systems like crazy. And that's in Springfield, Melville, as well as Jumping. So, okay. Anyway, where are we at with time? All right, we're, we're, we're doing well. We're doing we're good. Well. We're good. Running a large district of 22,000 students in, oh, I, yeah, we, I, I had 32,000, I had 25,000. Uh, uh, Melville was uh, 14,000, and so I've had those. And uh, to be honest with you, the larger the system, the, uh, the more success I've had, because basically you have more opportunities for collaboration. And, the, you know, uh, bringing fifth grade teachers together in a, in a district your size, there's more intelligence there than there is anybody coming from the outside to train these teachers. And so you need to collaborate and have that group, give them time to do that. And so larger districts, you tend to get more uh, energy and intelligence at the, at the forefront. And so what, what we did in Springfield, for instance, we set aside one Friday, but the teachers helped us to do this. We set aside one Friday every month. That's all they want. They didn't want any more because they get tired of talking to each other, by the way. And so they, they look at their data, and they find out who's successful, and they develop their own presentations or their own visits to the different classrooms um, when they're in their off days, they said, outside of that one day. And they always picked a Friday, of course. And so we were concerned about teachers taking long weekends. No, they came on that Friday because it was their Friday that they picked. And so it worked really well. So anyway, that, that's how we did that. And so I think the larger the district, uh, the more you're able to collaborate, the more you're able to bring intelligence uh, to uh, surround the child that's in your classroom. And also, I think that the other thing about the large district is you're able to take child, children that are very similar uh, types of children and bring them into an environment where they can uh, support each other. But there's also the opportunity in a fifth grade class or fourth grade classroom where you've got about 60% of the kids are overachievers, maybe 50%. That you, as a teacher collaborating with the staff, that the kids, that they eventually those 50% that are overachievers are gonna be, learn just as much helping the other kids and help the teacher teach. And so that's another example of uh, collaboration among systems. Managing a board and board governance. The president of the board manages the board. I'm sorry. And I work with the president of the board to manage you guys. And so if any of you guys are out of hand, I'm gonna go to Tom, I'm gonna say, Tom, let's have a conversation. And so we pretty much ignore him. Uh, I, 
Well, you know, then you got the wrong president. <laughs> Jeez. No, and so, and so anyway, uh, there's no question in my mind that, that if we have uh, five presidents, we got a problem as far as managing the board. So, but uh, one, one thing that I find that you guys need to give me a call when you hear anything positive or negative, and I have no problem with board members going to sites unannounced. And, um, and if you want me to come along and I can walk classrooms with you to kind of have a conversation about what I'm seeing, that'll help you understand uh, high-performing classrooms, I'll, I'm no problem with that at all, okay? And so to manage the board, or through the board president, um, and then eventually, you know, they always say, uh, watch out, the board can go, go into the weeds. Well, I do think in high-performing systems, the board, of course, is all about policy and governance, okay? Not, a, not, a, not, into, not into the classrooms and uh, uh, saying, get, you need to get rid of that teacher or we need to do this with this teacher. Uh, we will have conversations around that. We will, because I do think that's intimidating. Uh, but we can build up the comfort for you guys to be able to understand the classroom, to be able to understand the site by going to the sites. And if you don't have that, I don't know how you can make decisions on policy. So uh, managing the board, uh, like I told you, once a week, uh, maybe more I'll be calling you. Um, and it's just basically your opportunity to visit with me. And you, you're willing or, and welcome to call me anytime. And, uh, and I've had that happen. I had a board member that was driving me insane, okay, and because uh, she liked me. And uh, so I had to uh, have a conversation with her about uh, maybe some things that she needs to watch out for as far as being made or make phone calls and stuff because, you know, 11 o'clock at night, that's a little late. And, uh, we're talking about, you know, anyway. But that doesn't happen very often. That was once in 46 years I had somebody like that. So uh, I love working with boards. Any questions around managing the board? Okay, I think you know... Uh, and I'll walk through this with you a little bit as far as organizational analysis and how to analyze uh, the organization. I can guarantee you, you will have a full understanding of your organization as, as it relates to high performance. I'll give that to you. You will have that. And uh, you will know what your leadership looks like. It's takes opportunities, uh, and major challenges. You'll know what your strategic plan is, uh, how strategic your teachers are and everybody else, as opposed to a strategic plan. You'll know how strategic they are. And then you'll also know how well they're listening to their kids. And that's where I find the biggest problem is uh, <coughs> uh, staff, not just teachers, but staff listening to kids. That's, that's a thing that uh, needs a lot of work. And so anyway, so the feedback cycle is really a critical piece, and I'll give you feedback on that, pardon the pun there. And so anyway, so as far as organizational analysis, I will have, let's see, depends on when I would start, I will have eight weeks later, a, those three things, the strengths, opportunities, major challenges in front of you. Um, and then we will have a conversation about where that's all coming from. And, and we can align and have a conversation around your current strategic plan, the learning model, with what I'm finding. And, uh, and so I don't know how to predict that. I don't want to bet you there at all. Uh, but I, I've always told people you're going to be shocked what I come up with. And I think that's the good point. I think it, what you said is, how do you take what we have that's working and give it that look over and then be able to come back and, and be able to present us with those strengths and opportunities where we can get better? This morning with the conversation I had with the staff in the community, I asked them to come up with three strengths. And uh, they came up with the strength, and, I, and I, I could tell that they all didn't know that. And I says, now... That is a dynamite strength. Everybody needs to know that. And so there's the proclamation. You've got to proclaim. And then another strength that, uh, that they came up with, and I mentioned earlier, was a teacher retention. Nobody knew what it was. And you really should know what that is because I guarantee you a community like uh, Grand Junction, I just about said John, Grand Junction uh, is proud of its teachers, but also teachers want to come here, form, especially people who have graduated from here. And we need to proclaim that because people trust those that, that have been in the system. So that's how you do that. Okay, school finance and budget adoption. Um, transparency, over the board. And transparency means you've got to be simple with the message. People are not going to understand budget item. Is your CFO here? Not going to understand your budget item, identifying a budget code, and then you're going to have a descriptor about it. It's just that's insane. So you've got to simplify it in the budget language. Now, the budget approach is this. 
it changes every day. What I mean by that is this, that basically you zero in on the classroom and the student, and then you look to see how the resources are supporting that classroom and that student, okay? And then as you're analyzing that and you're a system that's constantly getting better on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, you're gonna identify things that where you're gonna to have to shift resources in that budget to do that. Now there are some budget items that the board's gonna to have to approve as far as shifting, but there's also gonna be some budget items where you can adjust within the system and advise the board. But either way, the board needs to be in the middle of that conversation because money drives uh, your performance, it really does. And so the efficiency and effectiveness around the use of those dollars is really critical. And so that's where you need to uh, be able to organize your budget and it needs to be something that's happening all year long. And so you take your budget and you analyze, discuss, analyze, discuss, and basically make sure it's very transparent. Okay, any questions on that? As far as budget adoption, I don't understand how that's done and I think that's just an automatic thing. That's just what it's gonna be. You guys shouldn't have any questions about it. It should just be, oh, I, this is the state thing. And you're gonna run across, oh, this is a state thing. And then outside of that, though, your system's gonna be responding to what the state requires. So a big part of that budget is, uh, is, is, is obviously labor. It is. And that's in our district driven um, uh, by negotiations with the teachers union every spring. That's right. Um, and then that, what, what's negotiated there generally goes to all staff. I mean, it's the same component, although the teachers are negotiating for a smaller group. And I guess I'd like to hear your philosophy a little bit about going into uh, negotiations next year with the teachers and uh, transparency and what that negotiation looks like and, and sure. that sort of thing. I've done all of it, all kinds of it. And so I need to find out what's successful now. It is bargain-based. Interest-based okay. bargain. Interest-based okay. okay. bargain. The thing that I, I find that works best with teachers and staff, give them the budget, okay? And as they work with the budget, and then uh, they bring it to the table, and um, my measuring stick is this. Are they working to make money, or are they working to improve the classroom? And I think as long as they are working to improve the classroom and bring more resources, <coughs> if they can show both, See, then the community is going to rally around them and give them all the resources that we need to be able to have talented teachers in front of them working with their kids. And so that's why I think uh, you need to have make sure that they know where every dollar is going. Now, they're going to scrutinize, and we need to make sure that there's common sense around the scrutiny of central office, central office dollars, for instance. You know, why are you making that much money, Norm? Well, that's what your board wants to pay me. And, uh, and I, of course, then I can explain. But either way, uh, you know, that's an extreme example because I could say that. I don't know about anybody else's salaries. But I know there was an issue around salaries in central office, by the way. I, I saw your report. And I do think we need to work through that process and get ownership around that whole process. I don't think it's something that where you're just going to cut salaries right away. I think you need to, you got contracts to deal with, but you also have to, teachers that have to be at the table having those conversations around. Where did, where did that all come from and how that all happened? Then we need to go mea culpa, mea culpa. I'm sorry, wrong language. Anyway, we need to feel that we're sorry and then uh, and then make the adjustments if need be and move on. So a lot of that is comparability as well. I do think though that we gotta be fair. If you're gonna empower teachers and you're gonna hold them accountable, you gotta pay them. And so, uh, and so you'll find that uh, um, we're gonna compare uh, not just in Colorado, we need to compare outside of Colorado because I think you do attract teachers not just from Colorado, you attract teachers from everywhere, so whatever, whatever the market is. But that's, that's how I, I would suggest we do that. And so um, now, who's at the bargaining table? Um, I've had it in St. Louis, for instance, where they had two board members at the bargaining table, the superintendent was at the bargaining table, and the teachers were at the bargaining table. That was insane because that. Oh, we're worse. Well, you're worse, okay. Mm -hmm. We, we have all board members at the table. It's a posted meeting. We, uh, we negotiate with 20, 25 people. Oh, wow. Well, I'd have to understand that and study that because basically what happened in St. Louis is that the teachers grew to hate the board. And basically they needed, they needed to have someone come in in between there to negotiate, to, to negotiate with, with the teachers so that therefore there wasn't blame because a lot of times what happened there 
was that one board member would say one thing and another board member would argue with that board member right, right, in, front of, right in front of the staff. And so that's... that's I, I guess we're... We do a good job. Well, some, some of the it things... Works. It works. Some, the, I really hate uh, the, the, the um, term systems analysis and organizational analysis because in my mind I'm not necessarily looking for a superintendent to look at everything this district does and tell us, yeah, I'm good, but you know, some of that I think is probably just fine. There are things like our relationship with the union that I'd be hard pressed to believe in you if you told us that system wasn't working. Oh no, I you know, so I mean, it's 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 it, and I, I, that's not a question. That's that's. Now remember, I start with the conversation with each one of you. So okay. that's where it starts. I'm not gonna. No, no. That, that's where it all starts. So, okay. All right. At the conclusion of this interim post, how would you define and describe success? You would, after it's all said and done, uh, the community, internal and external community, would have complete trust uh, that their children are getting the best, that they're on, you're on the path to getting the best education they, they can possibly get. That's what needs to be in place, and that's what I predict will be in place uh, when it's all said and done. And so, uh, describe success, that depends on what, what we're going to find as far as the needs are concerned. The, is it academic? Is it behavior? Is it uh, is it basically and so the learn is it the uh, you know the rollout of the learning model? Uh, how well has that been done? And uh, where is the ownership of that? Where's the buy-in for that? Okay. Any questions around that one? Okay. Is there anything in your background that you would like us to know more about? Uh, I think uh, I think you know that I'm a deacon in the Catholic Church. Um, I'm very very much into values, morals, ethics. Um, I'm very much into uh, uh, legal versus uh, ethics and uh, what that looks like. And so I've got some pretty sharp background around that. Um, then uh, the uh, the other thing that you may need to know more about me is that. Uh, I do have a very, very diverse background, uh, especially working with at-risk kids, uh, extremely strong in that area, um, and gifted kids, but mainly the, the at-risk kids, uh, diverse, diversity as well. And so anyway, um, that's pretty much uh, where I'm at with all that. If I could take you through this packet as part of that summary, um, I just want to point out a couple of things in this. How much time do we have left? Okay. 15 minutes I'm wondering if we have questions yeah, instead of a packet but if not I'm no I, I could take it to this uh, and that questions yeah. well I, I mean we, we obviously have a full CV and you've spent a great amount of time describing some really wonderful successes and there may be questions that really aren't in materials and you know in interviews people provide us with a lot of information which is great and I don't know that we need to talk about information that we might already have Oh, sure. But I'd love to talk about some things that might not be in the packet. Okay. If that's all right. Because if, especially if we only have 10 or 15 minutes left, I'd hate to not have time for that. Sure. So, uh, lovely background. I appreciate your CV. You've had a lot of experiences. And um, I, I really like in interviews to understand maybe things in your life that didn't go so well. Um, and what you learned from that. So I guess I might ask you about a time that you felt like things just didn't go very well at all. And what you learned and, and what you come forward from that. So I, could, I have a list of about a hundred. Well, you could just pick one. Pick one, okay. All right. <clears throat> I think the worst experience I had in my life in education was working for the Catholic Church and on the Archdiocese of that. And, uh, See, ever since I was little, everything's collaboration. You know, 12 kids in a house with three bedrooms. You kind of collaborate. You know. uh, food's put on the table, you kind of collaborate. All that kind of stuff. Then I, then I, so I were able to work through my system. Then I get come to the Archdiocese of Denver, and I come up with ideas, and, I, and then the bishop goes, nope, one person, nope. 
And so I, I had a hard time with that, and I stepped away. And I learned. And you'll see if you had a conversation with anybody that knows me and was with me at the time and with me and knew me coming into the academy district as a principal, because I wanted to be a principal to understand that level, uh, I turned around dramatically. And what I found out was um, I really identified with kids much better than I thought I would. And so I went into that, into that high school, and that high school was having major problems, and I turned it around in a year. And so the, the real issue, and what, that's where I found out as we have conversations with the kids with the greatest needs, you develop uh, student forms within, the, within the, the school itself. That's where I just came up with the whole idea of forms. And from that point on, I built forms every, every approach that I've taken. Okay. Another experience I had was D11. Um, um, politically at the time, you might remember, there was a, a, a voucher initiative that was put forward by the legislature and then our own union, by the way. And I was setting the stage for that. And we had a board. Diane will tell you about this one. Anyway, we, she, she worked for me. But anyway, we, we had a board that was absolutely crazy. And there were four of them that were pretty much put on the board and railroaded into being put, put on the board uh, to make sure the voucher system was going to be successful. And as soon as they were sworn in, um, uh, the Blaine Amendment said you can't do this. And so then the, the voucher system went south. And so then we had to deal with board members that uh, basically were anti-public schools. So that was really an interesting experience. And so that's where I learned, that's where I learned how to deal with board members one on one. And man, that was hard. And so that, those are probably your two extremes. You want any more? No, I was in, and I'm just interested more in things that weren't external failures of systems or other things, but <coughs> things you learned about yourself that you thought, you know, I'm not doing this the right way. I'm going to change things. I think I changed personality wise which is hard to do after the archdiocese. I, I went from a person who was controlling, who was basically, uh, you know, uh, really what I would call an introvert. Now everybody calls me an extrovert, and I'm really still an introvert. But anyway, everybody calls me an extrovert because that's all about getting out and making sure that you're listening, understanding, and that's how you do your work. It is not knowing it all and then putting it all down. Uh, like the bishop, and I'm not against Catholic bishops, but I just tell you that that was very frustrating. And I learned very fast. So, okay, good question. Any others? Yeah, normally when you're working with people and you're out and around, when you, when you meet with an individual, how do you know you've done a good job of listening? When I know them. But in other words, you could tell uh, whether they were comfortable with you or not through the eye contact. This is Boy Scout training, by the way. Uh, through the eye contact, through the voice tone. You can tell through the voice tone. Uh, you can tell through the hand movements, all that kind of stuff. And you can tell whether they're comfortable or not. I really haven't had anybody. I even had people who hate teachers, who were comfortable at having conversations with me. They were evil in the way they hate teachers. And, and, and really, when I, when, I, when I sit down with them, and I've heard that, I'll sit down and i have the conversation. And these are people who are 60, 70 years old. And I'll say, uh, can you tell me, or let's have a conversation around teaching, period. And then he gets into it, and he or she, but it's mostly he, will get into the fact that it's costing him too much money. Anti-tax people. And so, anyway, that's how I deal with it. And really, I think the, uh, uh, I'd like to identify, uh, if I were here longer, <coughs> uh, it takes about two years to get this in place, two or three years, to identify your, what I call uh, 250 key stakeholders that basically they apply and you basically set up that contact and when any, any kind of positive or concern issue comes up, you hit it, the email and it goes out to 250 people with talking points. And they have the information before the media does. Very powerful, very powerful. But you need to be able to make sure you trust that 250 people. But uh, man, that works nice. And that's how you build that, uh, that conversation with the community. Uh, by, by basically getting that message out and trusting people. So, any other questions? Anything else? No. Well, thank you very much for uh, spending. Can time. I can I take you through this real quick? Yes. I want to show you something. Just some quick highlights. Uh, this will be real quick. This will be real quick. Okay. 
I just want to point out the uh, this here this data baseline. Yeah. I'm wondering if you guys don't need to go through that and just think about it yourself. What does your community know about the basic information about your district? So that that is something we came up with that you need to pay attention to. And then you have a, a sample copies of the language around the leadership. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good Thanks luck. Coming over. Yeah. You know what I can do to help you? All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. So, Nikki, we have a time between Little the next break, yeah. How much? Uh, it's just, I think. 15? 10? Uh, we're actually ahead of schedule, so if you want to take a 5 or 10 minute break. Thank okay. you. So, 440 is the next Thank break. you. Thank okay. you. So what are, what are we doing every year? What do you guys got in your Sure. I think we're all done.